A Crime Scene by Albert Van Hoogmoge. There's been a murder, a woman has been killed, found in a bathtub partially filled. A pair of policemen went into the house and questioned the poor woman's spouse. He'd just come home from working all night and found her like this, a terrible sight. The younger policeman looked on with dismay. He'd never forget this terrible day. He saw the young woman from behind the door and empty milk cartons all over the floor, scattered strawberries and slices of fruit, spoonfuls of sugar and honey to boot. Who could have done this terrible thing? His voice had a horrified pitfall ring. Just look at the clues, replied Sergeant Miller. It looks like the work of a serial killer. <laughs> Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Lord Tennyson. Half a league, half a league, half a league onward. All in the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade! Charge for the guns, he said. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Forward the Light Brigade. Was there a man dismayed? Not though the soldier knew someone had blundered. There's not to make reply. There's not to reason why. There's but to do and die. Into the valley of death rode the 600. Can to the right of them, can to the left of them, cannon in front of them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell. Boldly they rode on well. Into the jaws of death, into the mouth of hell, rode the six hundred. Flashed all their sabres bare, flashed as they turned in air, sabring the gunners there. Charging an army, while all the world wandered, plunged in the battery smoke, right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from sabre stroke, shattered and sundered, then they rode back. But not, not the 600. Can to the right of them, can to the left of them, cannon behind them, volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell. While horse and hero fell, they that had fought so well came through the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of 600. The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind. No less, give somewhere back the thoughts by England given. Her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends and gentleness, in hearts at peace, under an English heaven. Just chat from Macbeth by William Shakespeare. Round about the Carlton goat, in the poison entrails throw, toad that in the cold stone days and nights has thirty one, sweated venom sleeping got, boiled thou first in the charmed pot, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, fill it up of fenny snake, in the cauldron boil and bake, I have neat and toe a frog. Wool of bat and tongue of dog, out of fork and blind woman's sting, with its leg and owl its wing, for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, skill of dragon, teeth of wolf, which is mummy, martin gulf, of the ravenous salt sea shark, root of hemlock, did in the dark, make the gruel thick and slab, 
add thereto a tig of Charlton, for the ingredients of our cauldron, double, double, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble. The Iliad by Homo, translated by Alexander Pope. Now shield of shield, with helmet, helmet closed, to armour, armour, lance to lance opposed. Host against host, with shadowy squadrons drew, the sounding darts in iron tempers flew. Victors and vanquished joined promiscuous cries and shrilling shouts and dying groans arise. With streaming blood, the slippery fields died and slaughtered heroes swell the dreadful tide. As torrents roll, increased by numerous rills, with rage impetuous down their echoing hills, rushed to the vales and poured along the plain, roar for a thousand channels to the main. The distant shepherd, trembling, hears the sound, so mix both hosts, and so their cries rebound. Goldilocks and the Three Bears by Roald Dahl. This famous wicked little tale should never have been put on sale. It is a mystery to me why loving parents cannot see that this is actually a book about a brazen little crook. Had I the chance, I wouldn't fail to clap young Goldilocks in jail. Now just imagine how you'd feel if you had cooked this lovely meal, delicious porridge, steaming hot, fresh coffee in the coffee pot, with maybe toast and marmalade, the table beautifully laid. One place for you and one for Dad, another for your little lad. Then Dad cries, golly gosh, gee whiz, oh cripes, how hot this porridge is. Let's take a walk along the street until it's cool enough to eat, he adds. An early morning stroll is good for people on the whole. It, uh, it makes your appetite improve. It also helps your bowels to move. <laughs> no proper wife would dare to question such a sensible suggestion. Above all, not at breakfast time when men are seldom at their prime. No sooner are you down the road than Goldilocks, that little toad, that nosy, thieving little louse comes sneaking into your empty house. She looks around. She quickly notes three bowls brimful of porridge oats. And while still standing on her feet, she grabs a spoon and starts to eat. I say again, how would you feel if you had made this lovely meal and some delinquent little tot broke in and gobbled up the lot? But wait, that's not the worst of it. Here comes the most distressing bit. You are, of course, a housebred wife. And all your happy married life, you have collected lovely things, like gilded cherubs wearing wings, and furniture by Chippendale, bought at some famous auction sale. But your most special valued treasure, the piece that gives you endless pleasure, is a small children's dining chair. Elizabethan, very rare. It is, in fact, your joy and pride passed down to you on Grandma's side. But Goldilocks, like many freaks, doesn't appreciate antiques. She doesn't care. She doesn't mind. And now she plonks her fat behind <laughs> upon this dainty, precious chair. And crunch! It busts beyond repair. A nice girl would at once exclaim, Oh dear, oh heavens, what a shame. Not Goldie, she begins to swear. She bellows, what a lousy chair, and uses one disgusting word that luckily you've never heard. <laughs> I dare not write it, even hint it. Nobody would ever print it. You'd think by now this little skunk would have the sense to do a bunk. But no! I very much regret. She hasn't nearly finished yet. Deciding she would like a rest, she says, let's see which bed is best. Upstairs she goes and tries all three. Here comes the next catastrophe. Most educated people choose to rid themselves of socks and shoes before they clamber into bed. 
but Goldie doesn't give a shred. Her filthy shoes are thick with grime and mud and mush and slush and slime. Worse still, upon the heel of one is something that a dog had done. Now, what would you think if all this horrid dirt and stink was smeared upon your eider down by this revolting little clown? The famous story has no clues to show the girl removed her shoes. Oh, what a tale of crime and crime. Let's check it for a second time. Crime one, the prosecution's case. She breaks and enters someone's place. Crime two, the prosecutor's notes. She steals a bowl of porridge oats. Crime three, she breaks a precious chair belonging to the baby bear. Crime four, she smears each spotless sheet with filthy messes from her feet. A judge would say, without a blink, ten years hard labour in the clink. But in the book, as you will see, the little beast gets off scot-free. Myself, I think, uh, while children near and far shout, goody good, hooray hooray, poor darling Goldilocks, they say, thank goodness that she got away. Myself, I think I'd rather send young Goldie to a sticky end. Oh, daddy, cried the baby bear, my porridge's gone, it isn't fair. Then go upstairs, the big bear said, your porridge is upon the bed, but as it is in, Mademoiselle, you'll have to eat her up as well. Hello, I'm Elliot Tolgard and I'm doing an extract from Dead Poet Society. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race. And the human race is filled with passion. Medicine, law, business, engineering. These are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. To quote from Whitman, O oh me, O oh life, of the questions of these recurring, of the endless trains of the faithless, of the cities filled with the foolish. What good amid these, O oh me, O oh life? Answer, that you are here, that life exists, and identity, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute to us, that the powerful play goes on, and you may contribute to us. What will your verse be? Yeah. The Blind Side by Michael Lewis. There's a moment of orderly silence before a football play begins. Players are in position, line men are frozen, and anything's possible. Then, like a traffic accident, stuff begins to randomly collide. From the snap of the ball to the snap of the first bone is closer to four seconds than five. One Mississippi. Joe Theismann, the Redskins quarterback, takes the snap and hands off to his running back, John Riggins. He watches Riggins run two steps forward, turn and flip the ball back to him. It's a trick play, what the Redskins call a throwback special. Two Mississippi. Theismann searches for a receiver, but instead sees Harry Carson coming straight at him. Carson thinks he's come to tackle Riggins, but Riggins is long gone, so Carson keeps running towards Theismann. Three Mississippi. Carson now sees that Theismann has the ball. Theismann notices Carson coming straight at him, and so it's time to avoid him. He steps up and to the side, and Carson flies right on by and out of the play. Up to now, the play's been defined by what the quarterback sees. It's about to be defined by what he doesn't. Four Mississippi. 
Lawrence Taylor is coming. He's the best defensive player in the NFL and has been from the time he stepped onto the field as a rookie. In 1982, after Taylor transformed the quarterback sack into the turning point of a football game, a new NFL, a new NFL statistic was born. A sack is defined as tackling the quarterback from behind the line of scrimmage as he attempts to pass. Taylor, of his own definition, a sack is when you run up behind somebody's not watching. He doesn't see you and you really put your helmet into him. The ball goes fluttering everywhere and the coach comes on and asks the quarterback, Are you alright? That's a sack! I'll drive my helmet into him, or if I can, I'll bring my arm up over my head and axe him in two. If I hit the guy right, I hit a no. He'll feel electrocuted. He'll forget for a few seconds he's on a football field. Taylor has evaded two Redskins players and is now bearing down on Seisman from behind at full speed. Seisman has played in 163 straight games, a record for the Redskins. He's led his team to two Super Bowls and won one. He's 36 years old. He certainly steals a few years left in him. He's wrong. He is less than half a second. Taylor's arms jackknife Steisman's head to his knees and his torso pins Steisman's right leg to the ground. The sound of Joe Steisman's leg breaking was like a gunshot. He never played another down of football. Now, you'd all probably guess that more often than not, the highest paid player on an NFL team is the quarterback. And you'd be right. What you probably don't know is that more often than not, the second highest played player is, thanks to Lawrence Taylor, the left tackle. Because as every housewife knows, the first check you write is for the mortgage and the second for the insurance. The left tackle's job is to protect the quarterback, the most valuable player on the team, from what he can't see coming, to protect his blind side. The ideal left tackle is big, but a lot of people are big. He's wide in the butt and massive in the thighs. He has long arms, giant hands, his feet as quick as a hiccup. This is a rare and expensive combination, the need for which can be traced to that Monday night game and Lawrence Taylor. For on that day, he not only altered Joe Theismann's life, but mine as well. The Lion and Albert by Marriott Edgar. There's a famous seaside place called Blackpool that's noted for fresh air and fun. And Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom went there with young Albert, their son. A grand little lad was young Albert, all dressed in his best, quite as well, with a stick with an oar said andal, the finest that Woolworths could sell. They didn't sink much to the ocean, the waves, they were fizzing and small. There were no wrecks, and nobody drowned. In fact, nothing to laugh at all. So seeking further amusement, they paid and went to the zoo, with their lions and tigers and camels, and old ale and sandwiches too. There were one great big lion called Wallace, whose nose were all covered in scars. He lay in a somnolent posture, with the side of his face on the bars. Now, Albert had heard about lions, how they was ferocious and wild. To see Wallace lying there so peacefully, well, it didn't seem right to the child. So straight away, the brave little fella, without showing a morsel of fear, took his stick with its oar said andal and shoved it in Wallace's ear. You could tell the lion didn't like it, for he gave a sort of a roll and he pulled Albert in the cage with him and swallowed the little lad whole. Then Pa, who had seen the occurrence and didn't know what to do next, said, Mother, your lions ate Albert. And Mother said, Well, I'm vexed. <laughs> then Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbottom, quite rightly, when all said and done, complained to the animal keeper that the lion had eaten the sun. The keeper was quite nice about it. He said, oh, what a nasty mishap. Are you sure it's your boy he's eaten? And Pa said, am I sure? 
There's his cap. The manager had to be sent for. He came and he said, what's to do? And Pa said, you lion say Albert. And him in his Sunday clothes too. The manager wanted no trouble. He took out his purse right away, saying, how much is settled the matter? And Pa said, what do you usually pay? <laughs> then Mother said, right, right, young feather. I think it's a shame and a sin for a lion to go and eat Albert after we've paid to come in. <laughs> the manager wanted, uh, but Mother turned a bit awkward when she realized where Albert had gone. She said, no, someone's got to be summoned. So that was decided upon. Then off they went to the police station in front of the magistrate chap. They told him what happened to Albert and proved it by showing his cap. The magistrate gave his opinion that no one was really to blame, and he said that he hoped that the Ramsbottoms would have further sons to their name. By that, Mother got proper blazing. And thank you, sir, kindly, said she. What waste stole our lives raising children to feed ruddy lions, not me. <laughs> This is the speech that Greta Thunberg gave to the UN General Assembly on the 23rd of September 2019. It is known as The World is Waking Up. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be standing here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have taken away my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are at the beginning of a mass extinction. Yet all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? For over 30 years, the science has been crystal clear. How dare you continue to turn away and come here saying that you're doing enough when the politics and solutions needed are still nowhere in sight. You say you hear us and though you understand the urgency, but no matter how sad or angry I am, I don't want to believe that. Because if you fully understood the situation and kept on failing to act, then you would be evil. And I refuse to believe that. The popular idea of cutting our emissions in half in 10 years only gives us a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees and the risk of setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond human control. 50% may be acceptable to you but seeing as those odds don't include tipping points, most feedback loops, additional warming hidden by toxic air pollution, and the aspect of equity, then a 50% risk is simply not acceptable to us. We who have to live with the consequences. We do not accept those odds. To have a 67% chance of staying below the 1.5 degrees global temperature rise, the best odds given by the IPCC, the world had 420 gigatons left to emit back on the 1st of January 2018. Today, that figure is already down to less than 350 gigatons. How dare you pretend that this can be solved with business as usual and some technical solutions? With today's emissions levels, that remaining CO2 budget will be entirely gone in less than eight and a half years. There will not be any solutions or plans presented in line with, these fig with this figure today because this number is too uncomfortable and yet you are still not mature enough to tell it as it is. Your generation is failing us, but the young people to are, st are starting to understand your betrayal. The eyes of all future generations are upon you. And if you do choose to fail us, then I say we will never forgive you. We will not let you get away with this. Right here, right now, this is where we draw the line. The world is waking up and a change is coming, whether you like it or not.
Daffodils by William Wordsworth I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er the vales and hills when all at once I saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake beneath the trees fluttering and dancing in the breeze continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. 10,000 saw, I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the waves, the sparkling waves, in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. <clears throat> River of Milk by Carve Akbar. Bear with me. It wasn't long ago. I was brainless, lazily pulling fireflies into my teeth, chewing them into pure light. So much of me then was nothing. I could have fit into a sugar cube. My body burned like a barn full of feathers. Nothing was on fire, but fire was on everything. The wild mustard, the rotting porch chair, a box of birth records. Eventually, even scorched earth goes green. Though beneath it, the dead might still luxuriate in their rage. My ancestor was a dervish saint, said to control a thick river of dark milk under his town. His people believed he could have spared them a drought. They ripped him to pieces like eagles, tearing apart a snake immediately. They were filled with remorse. Instead of burying him, they buried a bag of goat bones and a salia. My hair still carries that scent. My eyes, black milk and a snake's flicking tongue, does this confuse you? There are so many ways to be deceived. A butcher's thumb pressed into the scale. A strange blue dress in a bathtub. The slowly lengthening night. I apologize. I never aimed at eloquence. I told my mother I wouldn't live through the year, then waited for disaster. Sitting cheerfully on cinder blocks, pulled from a drain pond, tossing peanuts to squirrels. This is not the story she tells. Hers filled with happy myths, fizzy pistons, and plummy ghosts. It's true. I suppose you grow to love the creatures you create. Some of them come out with people swirling, others with teeth. The Listeners by Walter de la Mer. Is there anybody there? said the traveller, knocking on the moonlit door and his horse in the silence champed the grass of the forest's ferny floor. And a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveller's head. And he smote upon the door again a second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller. No head from the leaf-fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes where he stood perplexed and still. But only a host 
of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then, stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the faint moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to an empty hall, hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's cool. And he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky. For he suddenly smote on the door, even louder, and lifted his head. Tell them I came, and no one answered, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. I, they heard his foot upon the stirrup and the sound of iron on stone and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hooves were gone. King's Speech, Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 3, by William Shakespeare. Oh, my offence is rank. It smells to heaven. It hath the primal, eldest curse upon it. A brother's murder. Pray can I not, though inclination be as sharp as will. My stronger guilt defeats my strong intent, and like a man to double business bound, I stand in pause, why I shall first begin, and both neglect. What if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with brother's blood? Is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it as white as snow? Where too serves mercy, but to confront the visage of offence? And what's in prayer but this twofold force? To be forestalled ere we come to fall, or pardoned being down. Then I'll look up, my fault is past. But oh, what form of prayer may serve my turn? Forgive me my foul murder. That cannot be, since I am possessed for those effects for which I did the murder. My crown, my own ambition, and my queen. May one be pardoned and retain the offence. In the corrupted currents of this world, offence's gilded hand may shove by justice, and oft is seen the wicked prize itself, buys out the law, but tis not so above. There's no shuffling, there the action lies, and in his true nature, and we ourselves compelled. But even to the teeth and forehead of our own faults, to give in evidence, what then, what rests? Try what repentance can. What can it not? Yet, what can it when one cannot repent? O oh, wretched state, O oh, bosom black as death, O oh, limed soul struggling to be free, art more engaged. Help, angels, make a say. Bow stubborn knees and hearts with strings of steel. Be as soft as the sinews of the newborn babe. All may be well. This poem is an unpublished one written by Rudyard Kipling into the visitor's book of our hotel. This is the prayer the caveman prayed by Rudyard Kipling. This is the prayer the caveman prayed when first his household fire he lit and saw the solemn stars o'erhead contemptuously look down on it. The sweep and silence of the night, the dropping dark on every side, oppressed his simple mind with fright. And, heaven, send me friends, he cried. Wise friends who know what Rick will lure, the wounded mammoth to defeat, and cunning friends who have the cure for pains inside me when I eat. 
Strong friends who show how spears are hurled, and bold friends who charge and drive them in. It takes all sorts to make a world, but give me friends and I'll begin. The gods considered his distress and guided to his lonely blaze. Companions in loneliness, the cavemen of the elder days. With twitching nose and eyes astare, they crouched and watched him for a spell. Until his cautious, who goes there? They granted, friend, and all was well. And when at last their leave they took, refreshed by meat and drink and talk, for lack of any proper book, they scratched their totems on the chalk. And host and hostess at the door bade them goodbye and made their plan next Saturday to ask some more. And that was how the world began. The wash tub and the kitchen range, electric lighting, papers, pens, affect the life but do not change the heart of Homo sapiens. And the loneliest thing of all things made, he lights his fire at eventide and prays as his first fathers prayed for friends to gather there beside. And that is why I send this tome of virgin papers fitly wrought to hold the names of all who come beneath your roof at Cherkley Court. Oh, long, long may the record run, and you enjoy until it ends the four best gifts beneath the sun, love, peace, and health, and honest friends. I'm Charlie Noble, and I'll be doing A Prayer Before Birth by Lewis McNeese. I am not yet born. Oh, hear me. Let not the blood-sucking bat, or the rat, or the stoat, or the club-footed ghoul come near me. I am not yet born. Console me. I fear that the human race may with tall walls warm me, with strong drugs dome me, with wise lies lure me, on black racks rack me, in blood baths roll me. I am not yet born. Provide me with water to dandle me, grass to grow for me, trees to talk to me, sky to sing to me, birds and a white light in the back of my mind to guide me. I am not yet born. Forgive me for the sins that in me the world shall commit. My words when they speak me, my thoughts when they think me, my treason engendered by traitors beyond me. My life, when they murder by means of my hands. My death, when they live me. I am not yet born. Rehearse me and the parts I must play and the cues I must take when old men lecture me. Bureaucrats hector me, mountains frown at me. Lovers laugh at me when the white waves call me to folly and the desert calls me to doom. When the beggar refuses my gift and my children curse me. I am not yet born. Oh, hear me. Let not the man who is beast or who thinks he is God come near me. I am not yet born. Oh, fill me with strength against those who would freeze my humanity, would dragoon me into a lethal automaton, would make me a cog in a machine, a thing with one face, a thing against all those who would dissipate my entirety, would blow me thistle down hither and thither and hither and thither, like water held in the hands, would spill me. Let them not make me a stone, and let them not spill me, otherwise kill me. Thank you. Winter by Anne Hunter. Behold the gloomy tyrant's awful form, binding the captive earth in icy chains. His chilling breath sweeps o'er the watery plains, howls in the blast, and swells the rising storm. See from its centre bends the rifted tower, threatening the lowly vale with frowning pride. O'er the scared flock that seeks its sheltering side, a fearful ruin o'er their heads to pour. While to the cheerful hearth and social board, content and ease repair the sons of want receive from niggard fate their pittance scant, 
and while some shed bleak covert may afford, one poverty amidst her meagre host casts around her haggard eyes and shivers out the frost. Remains by Simon Armitage. On another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank, and one of them legs it up the road, probably armed and possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire, three of a kind letting fly, and I swear I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times, and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. And one of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story? Except, not really. His blood shadow stays on the street, and out on patrol, I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave, but I blink. And he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep, and he's probably armed and possibly not. Dream, and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head while I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant sun-stunned, sand-smothered land or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle. Here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Portrait of Our Death by Catherine Kylalia. <clears throat> there were four of us following a dirt road which began in the foothills and went right up into the mountains where a little cottage was waiting for us. We were driving slowly, packed in the blue hatchback, and it was getting late. And the rain, which had started earlier, had really began to pelt down. And then, coming round the sharp corner, we lost our grip. The wheel skidded, wrestling in the thick white rain, the mud. The driver, my friend, said, Whoa! As if you say to a horse, lifting his hands from the wheel. And I remember, as the car began to spin, the mountains turned green as we edged slowly towards the end of the road. We lean inwards, as you do in films, with a car at the edge of the cliff, watching through the windows, mesmerized, as the valley opened up in a passionate, open mouth kiss. We should have tumbled in, but we were left unfallen, not yet dead, with the radio still playing. The driver, my friend, looked green. Our death was not as we expected. The blue car descending down the steep gorge without ladder, slipping like a dangerous dress strap or a crap hand of cards flung down in disgust. We'd stopped too, we'd stopped too soon, left still as rocks, as upturned beetles wriggling their legs, or as roadside cows chewing slowly. The driver, my friend, lit a cigarette and sat down. The rain looked on with big cow eyes, not dying as suddenly being very hungry, and wet brown shoes caked in mud, but not caring, and the mountains feeling slow, and the heavy grey clouds like a washerwoman, sprinkling cotton before ironing it flat. Our death was just pure mathematics, the steep angle of the cliff which didn't meet the speed of the car. Our death was just a thing measured in pure increments, about 66% death and 33% non-death. Just a bit deathly. Probably, we decided, the mosquitoes in this heat would have sucked us all dry before our death got to us anyway. It was just a sip of the wheels, we said. A skid. Perhaps we'd made too much of its nearness. Our death was just a minor character, someone who appeared ten miles after a town called Rither of Altend and then went on. And we all felt quite energetic after that. It was hot, but it was exciting. What didn't, what didn't happen that night? 
and we went hiking and found a waterfall and fell from it into the deep black pools lying underneath. <laughs> Tribute to the Dog by George Graham Best. The best friend a man has in this world may turn against him and become his enemy. His son or daughter, who he is reared with loving care, may prove ungrateful. Those nearest and dearest to us, those whom we trust with our happiness and our good name, may become traitors to their faith. The one absolutely unselfish friend that a man could have in this selfish world, the one that never deserts him, the one that never proves ungrateful or treacherous, is his dog. A man's dog stands by him in prosperity and in poverty, in health and in sickness. He will sleep on the cold ground where the wintry winds blow and the snow drives fiercely, if only he may be near his master's side. He will kiss the hand that has no food to offer. He will lick the wounds and sores that come in encounters with the roughness of the world. He guards the sleep of his pauper master as if he were a prince. When all other friends desert, he remains. When riches take wings and reputation falls to pieces, he is as constant in his love as the sun in its journey through the heavens. If fortune drives the master forth, an outcast in this world, friendless and homeless, the faithful dog asks no higher privilege than that of accompanying him, to guard him against dangers, to fight against his enemies. When the last scene of all comes, and death takes his master in its embrace, and his body is laid away in the cold ground. No matter if all friends pursue their way, there by the graveside will the noble dog be found, his head between his paws, his eyes sad, but open in alert watchfulness, faithful and true, even in death. This is a piece called Friends, Romans, Countrymen by w uh, William Shakespeare and Act 3, Scene 2. Friends, Romans, Countrymen, let me your as I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them, <clears throat> the good is often tired with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all honourable men. Come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me, yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill? Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the lubrical. I thrice presented him with a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and sure he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause, what cause withholds you then? Some mourn for him. O oh, judgment, thou art led to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin. There with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me again. This is The Devil's Welcoming Speech by Rowan Atkinson. Oh, hello. It's um, 
It is nice to see you all here. Now, as the more perceptive of you have probably realised by now, well, this is hell. And I'm the devil. Good evening. But you can call me Toby, if you like. We try to keep things informal here, as well as infernal. <laughs> That's just a little joke. I, I tell it every time. Now, you're all here for eternity, Ooh. Uh, which I hardly need tell you is a heck of a long time. So you'll all get to know each other pretty well by the end. But for now, I'm going to have to split you up into groups. Will you stop screaming? Thank you. Murderers, murderers, just down here, please. Thank you. Uh, looters and pillagers, down here. Thieves, if you could join them. And lawyers, you're on that lot too. <laughs> Fornicators, if you could step forward, please. My God, there are a lot of you. <laughs> if we could split you up into uh, adulterers and the rest. Male adulterers, if you could just form a line in front of that small guillotine in the corner. Thank you. Um, the French, are you here? <laughs> if you'd like to just come down here with the Germans. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about. Hmm. Atheists. Atheist? Down here, please. You must be feeling a right bunch of nitwits. <laughs> Never mind. And finally, Christians. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm afraid the Jews were right. If you'd just like to come down here, please. <laughs> right. Are there any questions? Yes. No. I'm afraid we don't have any toilets here. If you hadn't gone before you came, I don't think you're going to enjoy yourself very much. But then I believe that's the idea. Well, then it's over to you, Adolf. And I'll catch you all later at the barbecue. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> to say goodbye, by Anna of Valverde San. To say goodbye means so little. We said goodbye to childhood. It came after us like a dog, tracking our steps. To say goodbye, to shut that obstinate door that just refuses to remain closed, that persistent scar oozes memory. To say goodbye, to say no. Who achieves it? Whoever found the magical key? Whoever found the point that slides us to oblivion, the land that will extirpate the roots without remaining forever closed over them? To say goodbye, to turn one's back. But who knows where the back is? Who knows the way that does not die in the well-traveled shortcut? To say goodbye, to yell because someone is saying something, to cry because something is being said. Because to say goodbye is never really enough. Because to say goodbye completely might be to find the spot to turn one's back. The spot to sink oneself into the final no, while life, slowly, seeps out. Jim by Hilaire Belloc. There was a boy whose name was Jim. His friends were very good to him. They gave him cheese and cake and jam and slices of delicious ham and chocolate with pink inside and little tricycles to ride and read him stories through and through and even took him to the zoo. But there it was, his dreadful fate, befell him, which I now relate. You know, at least you ought to know, for I have often told you so, that children never are allowed to leave their nurses in the crowd. Now this was Jim's special fable. He ran away when he was able, and on this inauspicious day, he slipped his hand and ran away. He hadn't gone a yard when, bang, a lion sprang and hungrily began to eat, the boy beginning at his feet. Now just imagine how it feels when first your toes and then your heels and by gradual degree your shins and ankles, calves and knees are slowly eaten, bit by bit. No wonder Jim tested it. No wonder they shouted, Hi! The honest keeper heard his cry. The very fact he almost ran to help the little gentleman. Ponto! He shouted as he came, for Ponto was the lion's name. 
Ponto! He shouted with an angry frown. Down, sir! Put it down! The lion made a sudden stop and let the dainty morsel drop and slunk reluctant to its cage, snarling in disappointed rage. When he bent over Jim, the honest keeper's eyes were dim. The lion, having reached his head, the miserable boy was dead. When the nurse informed his parents, they were more concerned than I can say. His mother, as she dried her eyes, said, Well, it gives me no surprise. He wouldn't do as he was told. His father, who was more self-controlled, bade all the children round attend to James's miserable end. Now always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse. <laughs>